So we're continuing with our book, Money Magnetism. And um, we are up to week number seven. And you've probably all realized, or those of you who have been um, with this from the start, you've probably realized that um, what we are learning is really universal principles that apply not just to money, but to everything else. And today's topic is to... What's today's topic? It helps to know, doesn't it? Um, to live wisely, give. Now, this theme has been coming through again and again in just about every chapter. But today's chapter is solely dedicated to this theme of giving. Last week, I mentioned the ski generation Ski as in spend the kids' inheritance. And um, I know the, when it comes to inheritance, um, it's a very polarizing um, subject. Some people feel strongly about not leaving anything to the kids, that they can um, fend for themselves. Some people feel very strongly about if I have something, yes, I do want to leave it to the kids. And I mean, everybody's got their own um, opinions. But you know, the thing is, when we're talking about uh, the principles of money magnetism, the general principle is that you are happier when you give than when you spend just for yourself. When you spend on just your bodily and egoic needs, while it may be pleasurable at the time, you can be certain that in the long run, it does not bring you any fulfillment it leads to pain. Now, this is just a general principle. It's a cosmic law. The uh, Sanskrit word for cosmic law is rit. Rit meaning that's just how it is. We may like it, we may not like it, we may think it's fair, unfair. Cosmic law doesn't really care for any of it. That's just how it is. So... Um, Let me just bring up. I'm trying to duck this mic. <laughs> I've made some notes from um, that chapter. So Swami says that any... Uh, so you know these days there's a lot of uh, talk about I need to look after myself first, I come first. And Swami actually quotes the, a book called looking out for number one, as in that number one is yourself and that we have to look after our own selves before we can look after anyone else. And Swami says that that's actually a false teaching. It's a false teaching. He says any teaching that suggests to look after your own needs and only your own needs is a false teaching. Why? We are part of a greater reality. As in, we do not exist in this world on our own. If you think of this world as a jigsaw puzzle, we are a small piece in it. Um, You know that uh, story that we um, read over and over when we do the Sunday service about the little bird? That actually tells us quite a lot, as in it tells us what is our mission when we come into this world. Is our mission to just have a great time and not worry about anything else? 
or are we here with a bigger mission? So in that story, for those of you who've never heard that story before, it's a story of a little bird that goes out into the world. And when it goes out into the world, the parents tell this bird, gain, parents give this bird some wisdom to go out with, like we all do with our children, you know, when they flee the nest, we kind of you know, tell them one or two things. And likewise, this um, parents of this bird, little bird said to the bird, gain strength and wisdom. And what you acquire, share with others, even as we have shared with you, for you are a part of all that is. And then um, the uh, same story uh, says the same thing in a slightly different way. It says, um, <coughs> and so it says, Ours was a holy mission. We were charged to learn great lessons from life, to be fruitful in the gifts that we have received and to expand and multiply them. As in, that is our mission. What we acquire, share with others to expand and multiply those gifts. That was our holy mission. But in this story, what then happens is the bird begins to think, how foolish of me to share with others what is mine. And then, of course, the bird gets into a lot of trouble with that kind of thinking. So... The principle we are talking about when we uh, in today's uh, session is that we are part of a bigger reality when it comes to money, and not just money, with anything, any talents that you have, any skills that you have. If you think that I want to keep this for myself, then sooner or later you find that it disappoints you. But when we share with others what we have, our skills, our talents, our money, that has a multiplication effect to it. It keeps giving, and in return, it makes us happy. Swami says, that which focuses one's attention narrowly on the body and the ego in the long run bring not fulfillment but pain. The basic instinct in life is to expand, to expand our identity, to expand our awareness, to expand our consciousness, to be part of something much bigger. And nature has a lot of metaphors that tell us exactly that. When you look at a river, a river doesn't just stay a river. It flows to join up to the sea. If you look at a plant or a tree, it grows up towards the light. If you look at a little boy, that little boy wants to be a big boy. We play those games, right, with our children. Oh, you're a big girl now. You're a big boy now. As in that is just how nature works. Everything wants to be more than what it is. And that's why, and uh, it's our nature to reach outwards. Why do we read? Because we want to expand on what we know. 
we watch television, we surf the internet, we read blogs and articles because it's in our nature to want to expand. Anything that denies that nature denies an essential reality, denies our essential reality. So, Swami says that pain accompanies any shrinking of identity, anything that expands inevi- expands us inevitably gives us joy. So, you know, in just about any decisions that we make in life, one of uh, the ways to think about it is, is this going to shrink my reality or is this going to expand my reality? And that which expands your reality brings you happiness. That which shrinks your reality brings you pain. You know, when we think uh, well of somebody, we feel happy. When we complain, whinge, you notice that we feel that pain in our own heart because it shrinks us. We are thinking that I and that other person are two separate beings. In fact, um, one of the things I've been thinking about is compassion. And is compassion something that we can cultivate or is it something that you either have or not have? And one of the insights that has come to me, and this is just one of the insights, I'm sure there are many other things that um, could be said about it, but one of the insights is truly able to understand the other person Master was once, when we say Master, I know there are a few new people with us today. When we say Master, we talk about Paramahansa Yogananda. So Master had um, someone who wanted to um, do a performance on stage. And this guy didn't quite have the abilities to do what he wanted to do. But anyway, he performed on stage and things didn't go quite well. And when things didn't go well, this man told Master why things didn't go well and he gave a lot of excuses. And of course, you know, when we um, kind of make excuses, we usually talk in terms of why everything else was not right. Maybe, I'm not quite sure what exactly he would have said, but I imagine that, oh, the microphone wasn't working, or the acoustics in the room were not very good, or this drum wasn't, didn't quite have the resonance that my drum back home has, you know, just that sort of thing. And um, Master said to him, I understand. And, um, but what Master really understood was why this person couldn't do what he said he wanted to do. Even though he thought that he could do it. And so when we truly understand someone and truly understand why they are the way they are, we can have compassion for them without any judgment. If someone doesn't quite do a good job, in some piece of work, yes, we can understand. We can understand that that, pers- that was that person's ability. And he or she did the very best for who they are. Um, Devi, Devi is um, a, our spiritual director, Jyotish and Devi, and she tells the story of um, how they had... Um, received some criticism from from another devotee in the form of a letter, you know, everything that these, uh, this couple were doing wrong. 
And you know, when somebody sends you a letter criticizing you for all the things that you are doing wrong, it of course it hurts. And you also ask yourself, is this true? Sometimes you want to, some people get angry, some people get defensive. We all have our ways of dealing with criticism. And so um, Devi asked Swami Kriyananda, uh, Swami Kriyananda is that man in blue there. And Swami's response, she asked him as in like, are we wrong in, you know, uh, what we are doing? Or is this man wrong in criticizing us? And Swami's response was, no, you are doing your very best for who you are. And that man is doing his very best for who he is. You know, when we expect other people to change, it brings us a lot of pain. But when we are charitable in how we... You see, when we talk about uh, to live wisely, give... We're not just talking about money, but being charitable even in our attitudes to other people. Like give people the benefit of who they are rather than thinking that I want this person to be different. If they are different, then I will be happy. I find that the moment I am charitable in my thinking of the other person, regardless of whether they're right, they're, none of that enters the equation. The truth is, we are all brothers, like we sang. We could be on opposing sides. And Swami says in that song, you know, a soldier I saw weeping beside a dying friend my officers had said I must hate him till the end, but seeing his grief, I knew we were brothers. So giving is not just giving money, but being charitable in our thinking as well. We are not flawless. It's just that our flaws are so much part of us that we just, you know, we either don't see it or we think that that is just the right way to be. But when we start accepting people for who they are, rather than thinking that they should be somebody else, we take a huge burden of ourselves. And there's a sense of lightness that comes. Our heart opens because it's a form of giving. You're not wanting anything from the other person. You're not taking anything from the other person, but being charitable in your heart, accepting the other person for who they are. You know, life is a little bit like this. We are all traveling, say, use the analogy of the river. We are in our own canoes in a river. There are a whole lot of canoes in this river. There are some that are out there in front, racing to the sea. There's a whole heap more in the middle. There are canoes at the back. But everybody is moving to the sea. It's just that some are further ahead than us. Some are with us. Some are a little bit behind us. And even what to us appears the wrong actions of somebody else is necessary for that other person for what it is they need to learn. It's like a child, you know. Once they 
touch something that's hot like a stove, they learn from that, I should not touch the stove again because I will burn myself. But until such time, that person may not learn. And so that wrong action or what appears to be wrong is a necessary action. And when we start having that viewpoint, then we just stop judging. We just at different stages in our expansion of awareness. The whole path of meditation really is to expand our awareness beyond our own self. Um, in our meditation techniques, we always finish our meditation techniques by praying for other people. Why? We find that in meditation, we receive. There's a lot that we receive. You feel a little bit of peace. That is a gift that you have received from your meditation practice. If you f are becoming a happier person, not so reactive anymore, less stressed, your health is improving as a result of your meditation. These are all gifts that you are receiving from your meditation practice. Do you really want to keep it just for yourself? No. We have a responsibility and obligation to share with others because we lose absolutely nothing when we share. If anything, we gain so much more because when our identity expands, everything that we need comes to us. That's the universal law. The rit, as it says in Sanskrit. Let's see what else Swami has said. If you really want fulfillment for yourself, include in your good the welfare of others. And then he says the ability to earn money should be offered in service. First upward to the divine, to God, and then outward to the divine in our fellow man. Don't imagine that you deprive yourself when you identify yourself with a greater reality. On the contrary, service to a high ideal ensures you the greatest possible happiness. The ultimate test of virtue is it gives joy, not pain. When you can try it out, you know, try it out in small ways. That when you give, what happens? And then we are blessed. The more we share of our abundance, the more we give, the more that we serve. And... Um, there's a little in here of what Paramahansa Yogananda has said. He says, practice gratitude because what gratitude does is it opens up the channels. Opens, and we've mentioned before that money is energy. It's a flow of energy. And when we are grateful, when we are thankful, we open up that we open ourselves up to receiving that flow. Think of it like this: say some, there's somebody, and whenever you give them something, they're just extremely thankful. And what do you want to do? You want to give them more because that person appreciates what you give them. 
Now, if you give to somebody who's always complaining about what you give to them, do you think you would feel inclined to give to that person? The answer is no. And likewise, everything that comes to us really is a gift from the divine. Our skills, our talents, they're not our own. They were gifts that were given to us. Yes, we may have worked for it, but at the same time, it's a two-way process. Yes, we can work for it, but there's also the divine grace. And so, nothing that we have, whether it's money, gifts, our skills, our talents, nothing is our own. So, why hoard? Hoarding diminishes the supply. It diminishes the supply. So in our meditation, we finished the meditation with healing prayers. And you could take the attitude that, oh no, I don't want to deplete my energy, so I don't want to give by praying for others. But there is no loss because the energy that flows through us is being replenished. The more we use, the more energy flows through us. And that same principle applies when it comes to money. But you've got to remember the first principle that we learned in chapter one, how you use your money is a very important principle as well. As in if you waste, then you might dry up that supply of money. But if you use it wisely, then it's like making the channel much bigger so that more can come to you. We cannot use any of these principles in isolation. We've got to use them all together, that money is a flow of energy. It has to be used rightly. We have to use it in a way that not only benefits me, but it benefits, it's for a greater good. You know, so all of these principles have to be applied together. Um, What Master has said here is thanksgiving and praise open in your consciousness the way for spiritual growth and supply to come to you. Let me put on my glasses. I can barely read this. Spirit pushes itself out into the visible manifestation as soon as a channel is opened through which it can flow. You should be thankful for everything at all times. Realize that all power to think, speak, act comes from God and that He is with you now, guiding and inspiring you. Open your eyes and see the good that you now have and then keep alert and alive to recognize each new manifestation as it comes to you. Speak with devotion to the Father and thank Him for all the good things of your life. He is with you always and nothing can interfere with success if you acknowledge the divine power within you. So we are all children of God. Our first task is to identify ourselves as children of the Father or children of the Divine Mother, children of God, however you want to say it. And then once that realization comes that Ah, I am the so at first it'll be an affirmation, and then comes the realization. And when that realization comes, we can then claim our share of the divine inheritance, as in everything the Father has is ours. We are the ears. The Father doesn't say, when I say the Father, I mean the divine God. The Father doesn't say that, oh no, I'm going to spend everything that I have on my own self. He wants to give it 
to us. And likewise, we do the same. We copy. We are made in the image of the Father. We copy what the Father does. He gives us wealth. We pass our wealth to others. So next week's on oh, sorry um, next week we're going to um, take a break from money magnetism because it's Guru Purnima. Guru Purnima is um, it's a full moon day next Wednesday and it's a day for the Guru. It comes around July August every year that one day. And so what we'll be doing is we'll be celebrating. Um, the fact that we've got not one guru but a whole line of gurus and we've got uh, several people each one has decided to talk on about one of the gurus so we'll have a few different people uh, giving the session because I don't know if you know but we have got many meditation teachers trained med meditation teachers in our group and so um, Karen is going to be talking about Lahiri, Lahiri Mahashaya. Mm -hmm. Shelley is going to talk about um, Sri Yukteswar. Linda, who lives in the South Island, I can't see her there today. She's is she there? Yeah, oh, yeah, she is there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there she is. Yeah. And Linda's going to talk um, about Paramahansa Yogananda and Naraya, who uh, lives in Fangarei, and uh, there she is. Naraya is going to uh, talk about Babaji. And nobody took Jesus, so I've taken <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> and yeah, I think it should be fun. We'll have a mini kirtan depending on who's here. Uh, uh, what we are able to do. So whoever's planning the uh, few chants for next week, uh, we could do some chants that honor our gurus. Uh, if you want, you can bring a flower to, you know, put at the altar in whatever way you want to express your devotion next week. So, And if the weather would have been, if we were not in winter, we this is something we could have done outside because in Palo Alto, that's how they do it. They do this outside and they have the, the shrine set up for the different masters and they move from one shrine to the other, um, talking about the masters. So we'll see how we do it next week. Uh, we might have some creative ideas, but let's make it fun. Let's make it enjoyable. And at the same time, we can learn more about the masters and from different people, you know, how they relate to these different masters rather than just listening to what I have to say. So anyway, shall we finish with um, make us, uh, what do you call it? Lord Most High? Can I give you this? Uh... Precious on to the words. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hang on. Let me just... <clears throat> Got the words? Lord most high, O oh, heavenly Father, all our lives we dedicate to Thee, all our labors, all our joys and woes, all our channel of thy peace. When in darkness, guide us from above. With in sorrow, may we sow thy joy. With this hatred, may we share. Thy love.
Mother, beloved God, friend, beloved God, our line of gurus, our line of gurus, saints of all religions, and saints of all religions, we humbly bow at your feet. We humbly bow at your feet. May thy love shine forever. May thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of our devotion. On the sanctuary of our devotion. And may we be able to awaken. And may we be able to awaken. Thy love in all hearts. Thy love in all hearts. Thank you all for coming and I'll see you next week. Wonderful. Yes, that was lovely. Thank you, thank you everyone.